James Dewey Watson born April 6, 1928, is an American molecular biologist, geneticist and zoologist. In 1953, he co-authored with Francis Crick the academic paper proposing the double helix structure of the DNA molecule. Watson, Crick, and Morris Wilkins were awarded the 1962 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for their discoveries concerning the molecular structure of nucleic acids and its significance for information transfer in living material." Watson earned degrees at the University of Chicago BS, 1947, and Indiana University PhD, 1950. Following a postdoctoral year at the University of Copenhagen with Hermann Kalker and Ole Marlow, Watson worked at the University of Cambridge's Cavendish Laboratory in England, where he first met his future collaborator Francis Crick. From 1956 to 1976, Watson was on the faculty of the Harvard University Biology Department, promoting research in molecular biology. From 1968 he served as director of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory CSHL, greatly expanding its level of funding and research. At CSHL, he shifted his research emphasis to the study of cancer, along with making it a world-leading research center in molecular biology. In 1994, he started as president and served for ten years. He was then appointed chancellor, serving until he resigned in 2007 after making comments claiming a genetic link between intelligence and race. Between 1988 and 1992, Watson was associated with the National Institutes of Health, helping to establish the Human Genome Project. Watson has written many science books, including the textbook Molecular Biology of the Gene 1965 and his best-selling book The Double Helix 1968. In January 2019, following the broadcast of a television documentary in which Watson repeated his views about race and genetics, CSHL revoked honorary titles that it had awarded to him and severed all ties with him. Early life and education James D. Watson was born in Chicago on April 6, 1928, as the only son of Jean Mitchell and James D. Watson, a businessman descended mostly from colonial English immigrants to America. His mother's father, Lachlan Mitchell, a tailor, was from Glasgow, Scotland, and her mother, Lizzie Gleeson, was the child of parents from County Tipperary. Raised Catholic, he later described himself as, "...an escapee from the Catholic religion." Watson said, "...the luckiest thing that ever happened to me was that my father didn't believe in God." Watson grew up on the south side of Chicago and attended public schools, including Horace Mann Grammar School and South Shore High School. He was fascinated with bird watching, a hobby shared with his father, so he considered majoring in ornithology. Watson appeared on Quiz Kids, a popular radio show that challenged bright youngsters to answer questions. Thanks to the liberal policy of University President Robert Hutchins, he enrolled at the University of Chicago, where he was awarded a tuition scholarship, at the age of 15, after reading Erwin Schrödinger's book What is Life? In 1946, Watson changed his professional ambitions from the study of ornithology to genetics. Watson earned his B.S. degree in zoology from the University of Chicago in 1947. In his autobiography, Avoid Boring People, Watson described the University of Chicago as an idyllic academic institution where he was instilled with the capacity for critical thought and an ethical compulsion not to suffer fools who impeded his search for truth, in contrast to his description of later experiences. 
In 1947 Watson left the University of Chicago to become a graduate student at Indiana University, attracted by the presence at Bloomington of the 1946 Nobel Prize winner Hermann Joseph Muller, who in crucial papers published in 1922, 1929, and in the 1930s had laid out all the basic properties of the heredity molecule that Schrödinger presented in his 1944 book. He received his Ph.D. degree from Indiana University in 1950. Salvador Luria was his doctoral advisor. Topic: <laughs> 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 Career and research. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Luria, Delbruck, and the Phage Group. Originally, Watson was drawn into molecular biology by the work of Salvador Luria. Luria eventually shared the 1969 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for his work on the Luria-Delbruck experiment, which concerned the nature of genetic mutations. He was part of a distributed group of researchers who were making use of the viruses that infect bacteria, called bacteriophages. He and Max Delbruck were among the leaders of this new phage group, an important movement of geneticists from experimental systems such as Drosophila towards microbial genetics. Early in 1948, Watson began his Ph.D. research in Luria's laboratory at Indiana University. That spring, he met Delbruck first in Luria's apartment and again that summer during Watson's first trip to the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory CSHL, the phage group was the intellectual medium where Watson became a working scientist. Importantly, the members of the phage group sensed that they were on the path to discovering the physical nature of the gene. In 1949, Watson took a course with Felix Hauerwitz that included the conventional view of that time, that genes were proteins and able to replicate themselves. The other major molecular component of chromosomes, DNA, was widely considered to be a stupid tetranucleotide, serving only a structural role to support the proteins. Even at this early time, Watson, under the influence of the phage group, was aware of the avery mcleod mccarty experiment, which suggested that DNA was the genetic molecule. Watson's research project involved using X-rays to inactivate bacterial viruses. Watson then went to Copenhagen University in September 1950 for a year of postdoctoral research, first heading to the laboratory of biochemist Hermann Kalker. Kalka was interested in the enzymatic synthesis of nucleic acids, and he wanted to use phages as an experimental system. Watson wanted to explore the structure of DNA, and his interests did not coincide with Kalka's. After working part of the year with Kalka, Watson spent the remainder of his time in Copenhagen conducting experiments with microbial physiologist Ole Marlow, then a member of the phage group. The experiments, which Watson had learned of during the previous summer's Cold Spring Harbor Phage Conference, included the use of radioactive phosphate as a tracer to determine which molecular components of phage particles actually infect the target bacteria during viral infection. The intention was to determine whether protein or DNA was the genetic material, but upon consultation with Max Delbruck, they determined that their results were inconclusive and could not specifically identify the newly labeled molecules as DNA. Watson never developed a constructive interaction with Kalka, but he did accompany Kalka to a meeting in Italy, where Watson saw Morris Wilkins talk about his X ray diffraction data for DNA. Watson was now certain that DNA had a definite molecular structure that could be elucidated. In 1951, the chemist Linus Pauling in California published his model of the amino acid alpha helix, a result that grew out of Pauling's efforts in X ray crystallography and molecular model building. 
After obtaining some results from his phage and other experimental research conducted at Indiana University, Staten's Serum Institute Denmark, CSHL, and the California Institute of Technology, Watson now had the desire to learn to perform X-ray diffraction experiments so he could work to determine the structure of DNA. That summer, Luria met John Kendrew, and he arranged for a new postdoctoral research project for Watson in England. In 1951 Watson visited the Stazione Zoologica Anton Dorn in Naples. <laughs> Identifying the double helix In mid-March 1953, Watson and Crick deduced the double helix structure of DNA. Crucial to their discovery were the experimental data collected at King's College London—mainly by Rosalind Franklin, under the supervision of Morris Wilkins. Sir Lawrence Bragg, the director of the Cavendish Laboratory where Watson and Crick worked, made the original announcement of the discovery at a Solvay conference on proteins in Belgium on April 8, 1953. It went unreported by the press. Watson and Crick submitted a paper entitled Molecular Structure of Nucleic Acids, a structure for deoxyribose nucleic acid to the scientific journal Nature, which was published on April 25, 1953. Bragg gave a talk at the Guy's Hospital Medical School in London on Thursday, May 14, 1953, which resulted in a May 15, 1953, article by Ritchie Calder in the London newspaper News Chronicle, entitled, Why You Are You? Near a Secret of Life. Sidney Brenner, Jack Dunnitz, Dorothy Hodgkin, Leslie Orgel, and Beryl M. Orton were some of the first people in April 1953 to see the model of the structure of DNA, constructed by Crick and Watson. At the time, they were working at Oxford University's chemistry department. All were impressed by the new DNA model, especially Brenner, who subsequently worked with Crick at Cambridge in the Cavendish Laboratory and the new Laboratory of Molecular Biology. According to the late Beryl Orton, later Rimmer, they all travelled together in two cars once Dorothy Hodgkin announced to them that they were off to Cambridge to see the model of the structure of DNA. The Cambridge University student newspaper Varsity also ran its own short article on the discovery on Saturday, May 30, 1953. Watson subsequently presented a paper on the double helical structure of DNA at the 18th Cold Spring Harbor Symposium on Viruses in early June 1953, six weeks after the publication of the Watson and Crick paper in Nature. Many at the meeting had not yet heard of the discovery. The 1953 Cold Spring Harbor Symposium was the first opportunity for many to see the model of the DNA double helix. Watson, Crick, and Wilkins were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1962 for their research on the structure of nucleic acids. Rosalind Franklin had died in 1958 and was therefore ineligible for nomination. The publication of the double helix structure of DNA has been described as a turning point in science. Understanding of life was fundamentally changed and the modern era of biology began. Topic use of the King's College results Watson and Crick's use of DNA X-ray diffraction data collected by Rosalind Franklin and Raymond Gosling was unauthorized. They used some of her unpublished data, without her consent, in their construction of the double helix model of DNA. Franklin's results provided estimates of the water content of DNA crystals and these results were consistent with the two sugar phosphate backbones being on the outside of the molecule. Franklin told Crick and Watson that the backbones had to be on the outside, before then, Linus Pauling and Watson and Crick had erroneous models with the chains inside and the bases pointing outwards. Her identification of the space group for DNA crystals revealed to Crick that the two DNA strands were antiparallel. The X-ray diffraction images collected by Gosling and Franklin provided the best evidence for the helical nature of DNA. 
Watson and Crick had three sources for Franklin's unpublished data, her 1951 seminar, attended by Watson, discussions with Wilkins, who worked in the same laboratory with Franklin, a research progress report that was intended to promote coordination of Medical Research Council-supported laboratories. Watson, Crick, Wilkins and Franklin all worked in MRC laboratories. According to one critic, Watson's portrayal of Franklin in the double helix was negative and gave the appearance that she was Wilkins' assistant and was unable to interpret her own DNA data. The accusation was indefensible since Franklin told Crick and Watson that the helix backbones had to be on the outside. A review of the correspondence from Franklin to Watson, in the archives at CSHL, reveals that the two scientists later exchanged of constructive scientific correspondence. Franklin consulted with Watson on her tobacco mosaic virus RNA research. Franklin's letters begin on friendly terms with Dear Jim, and conclude with equally benevolent and respectful sentiments such as Best wishes, yours, Rosalind. Each of the scientists published their own unique contributions to the discovery of the structure of DNA in separate articles, and all of the contributors published their findings in the same volume of Nature. These classic molecular biology papers are identified as, Watson J.D. and Crick F.H.C. A structure for deoxyribose nucleic acid Nature 171, 737 to 738, 1953, Wilkins M.H.F., Stokes A.R. and Wilson, H.R. Molecular structure of deoxypentose nucleic acids, Nature 171, 738 to 740, 1953, Franklin R. and Gosling R. G. Molecular configuration in sodium thymonucleate, Nature 171, 740 to 741, 1953. Topic. Harvard University In 1956, Watson accepted a position in the biology department at Harvard University. His work at Harvard focused on RNA and its role in the transfer of genetic information. He championed a switch in focus for the school from classical biology to molecular biology, stating that disciplines such as ecology, developmental biology, taxonomy, physiology, etc. had stagnated and could progress only once the underlying disciplines of molecular biology and biochemistry had elucidated their underpinnings, going so far as to discourage the study by students. Watson continued to be a member of the Harvard faculty until 1976, even though he took over the directorship of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory in 1968. Views on Watson's scientific contributions while at Harvard are somewhat mixed. His most notable achievements in his two decades at Harvard may be what he wrote about science, rather than anything he discovered during that time. Watson's first textbook, The Molecular Biology of the Gene, set a new standard for textbooks, particularly through the use of concept heads—brief declarative subheadings. His next textbook was Molecular Biology of the Cell, in which he coordinated the work of a group of scientist writers. His third textbook was Recombinant DNA, which described the ways in which genetic engineering has brought much new information about how organisms function. The textbooks are still in print. <laughs> Publishing the double helix In 1968, Watson wrote The Double Helix, listed by the Board of the Modern Library as number seven in their list of 100 best nonfiction books. The book details the sometimes painful story of not only the discovery of the structure of DNA, but also the personalities, conflicts and controversy surrounding their work. Watson's original title was to have been, Honest Jim in that the book recounts the discovery of the double helix from Watson's point of view and included many of his private emotional impressions at the time. Some controversy surrounded the publication of the book. 
Watson's book was originally to be published by the Harvard University Press, but Francis Crick and Morris Wilkins objected, among others. Watson's home university dropped the project and the book was commercially published. During his tenure at Harvard, Watson participated in a protest against the Vietnam War, along with 12 faculty members of the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. Including one other Nobel Prize winner, he spearheaded a resolution for the immediate withdrawal of U.S. forces from Vietnam. In 1975, on the 30th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima, Watson, along with over 2,000 scientists and engineers, spoke out against nuclear proliferation to President Ford in part because of the lack of a proven method for the ultimate disposal of radioactive waste. And because the writers of the declaration see the proliferation of nuclear plants as a major threat to American liberties and international safety because they say safeguard procedures are inadequate to prevent terrorist theft of commercial reactor produced plutonium. Topic: <laughs> Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. In 1968, Watson became the director of the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory CSHL. Between 1970 and 1972, the Watson's two sons were born, and by 1974, the young family made Cold Spring Harbor their permanent residence. Watson served as the laboratory's director and president for about 35 years, and later he assumed the role of chancellor and then chancellor emeritus. In his roles as director, president, and chancellor, Watson led CSHL to articulate its present-day mission, "...dedication to exploring molecular biology and genetics in order to advance the understanding and ability to diagnose and treat cancers, neurological diseases, and other causes of human suffering." CSHL substantially expanded both its research and its science educational programs under Watson's direction. He is credited with "...transforming a small facility into one of the world's great education and research institutions." Initiating a program to study the cause of human cancer, scientists under his direction have made major contributions to understanding the genetic basis of cancer. In a retrospective summary of Watson's accomplishments there, Bruce Stillman, the laboratory's president, said, Jim Watson created a research environment that is unparalleled in the world of science. In 2007, Watson said, I turned against the left wing because they don't like genetics, because genetics implies that sometimes in life we fail because we have bad genes. They want all failure in life to be due to the evil system. <laughs> Human Genome Project In 1990, Watson was appointed as the head of the Human Genome Project at the National Institutes of Health, a position he held until April 10, 1992. Watson left the Genome Project after conflicts with the new NIH director, Bernadine Healy. Watson was opposed to Healy's attempts to acquire patents on gene sequences, and any ownership of the laws of nature. Two years before stepping down from the Genome Project, he had stated his own opinion on this long and ongoing controversy which he saw as an illogical barrier to research, he said, "...the nations of the world must see that the human genome belongs to the world's people, as opposed to its nations." He left within weeks of the 1992 announcement that the NIH would be applying for patents on brain specific cDNAs. The issue of the patentability of genes has since been resolved in the U.S. by the U.S. Supreme Court, see Association for Molecular Pathology v. U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. In 1994, Watson became president of CSHL. Francis Collins took over the role as director of the Human Genome Project. 
He was quoted in the Sunday Telegraph in 1997 as stating, "...if you could find the gene which determines sexuality and a woman decides she doesn't want a homosexual child, well, let her." The biologist Richard Dawkins wrote a letter to The Independent claiming that Watson's position was misrepresented by the Sunday Telegraph article, and that Watson would equally consider the possibility of having a heterosexual child to be just as valid as any other reason for abortion. To emphasize that Watson is in favor of allowing choice, on the issue of obesity, Watson was quoted in 2000, saying, Whenever you interview fat people, you feel bad, because you know you're not going to hire them." Watson has repeatedly supported genetic screening and genetic engineering in public lectures and interviews, arguing that stupidity is a disease and the "...really stupid..." bottom 10% of people should be cured. He has also suggested that beauty could be genetically engineered, saying in 2003, People say it would be terrible if we made all girls pretty. I think it would be great. In 2007, James Watson became the second person to publish his fully sequenced genome online, after it was presented to him on May 31, 2007, by 454 Life Sciences Corporation in collaboration with scientists at the Human Genome Sequencing Center, Baylor College of Medicine. Watson was quoted as saying, I am putting my genome sequence online to encourage the development of an era of personalized medicine, in which information contained in our genomes can be used to identify and prevent disease and to create individualized medical therapies. <laughs> Later life In 2014 Watson published a paper in The Lancet suggesting that biological oxidants may have a different role than is thought in diseases including diabetes, dementia, heart disease and cancer. For example, type 2 diabetes is usually thought to be caused by oxidation in the body that causes inflammation and kills off pancreatic cells. Watson thinks the root of that inflammation is different a lack of biological oxidants, not an excess", and discusses this in detail. One critical response was that the idea was neither new nor worthy of merit, and that The Lancet published Watson's paper only because of his name. Other scientists have expressed their support for his hypothesis and have proposed that it can also be expanded to why a lack of oxidants can result in cancer and its progression. In 2014, Watson sold his Nobel Prize medal to raise money, part of the funds raised by the sale went to support scientific research. The medal sold at auction at Christie's in December 2014 for $4.1 million. Watson intended to contribute the proceeds to conservation work in Long Island and to funding research at Trinity College, Dublin. He was the first living Nobel recipient to auction a medal. The medal was later returned to Watson by the purchaser, Alisha Usmanov. <laughs> Notable former students Several of Watson's former doctoral students subsequently became notable in their own right including, Mario Capecchi, Bob Horvitz, Peter B. Moore and Joan Stites. Besides numerous PhD students, Watson also supervised postdoctoral students and other interns including Ewan Burney, Ronald W. Davis, Philip Allen Sharp postdoc, John Toos postdoc, and Richard J. Roberts postdoc. Other affiliations Watson is a former member of the board of directors of United Biomedical, Inc., founded by Chang Yi Wang. 
He held the position for six years and retired from the board in 1999. In January 2007, Watson accepted the invitation of Leonor Beleza, president of the Champalamo Foundation, to become the head of the foundation's scientific council, an advisory organ. Watson has also been an institute advisor for the Allen Institute for Brain Science. Topic: Avoid boring people. Watson has had disagreements with Craig Venter regarding his use of S fragments while Venter worked at NIH. Venter went on to found Celera Genomics and continued his feud with Watson. Watson was quoted as calling Venter Hitler. In his memoir, Avoid Boring People, Lessons from a Life in Science, Watson describes his academic colleagues as dinosaurs, deadbeats, fossils, has-beens, mediocre, and vapid. Steve Schappen in Harvard Magazine noted that Watson had written an unlikely book of manners telling about the skills needed at different times in a scientist's career, he wrote Watson was known for aggressively pursuing his own goals at the university. E. O. Wilson once described Watson as, "...the most unpleasant human being I had ever met." but in a later TV interview said that he considered them friends and their rivalry at Harvard Old History when they had competed for funding in their respective fields. In the epilogue to the memoir Avoid Boring People, Watson alternately attacks and defends former Harvard University President Lawrence Summers, who stepped down in 2006 due in part to his remarks about women and science. Watson also states in the epilogue, anyone sincerely interested in understanding the imbalance in the representation of men and women in science must reasonably be prepared at least to consider the extent to which nature may figure, even with the clear evidence that nurture is strongly implicated. <laughs> Comments on race At a conference in 2000, Watson suggested a link between skin color and sex drive, hypothesizing that dark-skinned people have stronger libidos. His lecture argued that extracts of melanin, which gives skin its color, had been found to boost subjects' sex drive. That's why you have Latin lovers, he said, according to people who attended the lecture. You've never heard of an English lover. Only an English patient. He has also said that stereotypes associated with racial and ethnic groups have a genetic basis, Jews being intelligent, Chinese being intelligent but not creative because of selection for conformity, and Indians being servile. Watson has repeatedly asserted that differences in average measured IQ between blacks and whites are due to genetics. In early October 2007, he was interviewed by Charlotte Hunt Grubb at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory CSHL. He discussed his view that Africans are less intelligent than Westerners. Watson said his intention was to promote science, not racism, but some UK venues cancelled his appearances, and he cancelled the rest of his tour. An editorial in Nature said that his remarks were, "...beyond the pale." but wished that the tour had not been cancelled so that Watson would have had to face his critics in person, encouraging scientific discussion on the matter. Because of the controversy, the Board of Trustees at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory suspended Watson's administrative responsibilities. Watson issued an apology, then retired at the age of 79 from CSHL from what the lab called, "...nearly 40 years of distinguished service." Watson attributed his retirement to his age, and circumstances that he could never have anticipated or desired. In 2008, Watson was appointed Chancellor Emeritus of CSHL. In a BBC documentary that year, Watson said he did not see himself as a racist. 
As of 2009, he continued to advise and guide project work at the laboratory. In January 2019, following the broadcast of a television documentary made the previous year in which he repeated his views about race and genetics, CSHL revoked honorary titles that it had awarded to Watson and cut all remaining ties with him. Watson did not respond to the developments, having been ill since a car accident in October 2018. Topic: Personal life. Watson is an atheist. In 2003, he was one of 22 Nobel laureates who signed the Humanist Manifesto. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Marriage and family. Watson married Elizabeth Lewis in 1968. They have two sons, Rufus Robert Watson born 1970 and Duncan James Watson 1972. Watson sometimes talks about his son Rufus, who suffers from schizophrenia, seeking to encourage progress in the understanding and treatment of mental illness by determining how genetics contributes to it. <laughs> Awards and honors Watson has won numerous awards including Topic Honorary Degrees Received Topic Professional and Honorary Affiliations Topic See also Behavioral genetics History of molecular biology History of RNA biology List of RNA biologists Predictive medicine Whole genome sequencing